Awesome, thank you, John. Um, I do wanna share that these questions and concerns came through to us via survey. We did a thought exchange in which um, we had folks from across our district community submit their thoughts and concerns about safety, security, health, and wellness here in the district. And we had an opportunity to look and gather the, what um, folks have submitted. And we were able to decide and, and figure out um, what rose to the level of, of bringing this panel together. So thank you so much for being here today. And thank you to our guests for, um, for participating. And thank you to the folks who actually wrote and submitted questions and concerns, because now we can actually get into the nitty gritty of what folks want to hear from y'all. So what I'm going to start off with, I'm going to hand out these mics. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one going down each side and we're going to pass these around. But we're going to start off with just our panel in general. If you could just start off by telling us a little bit about yourselves and um, what your experience is in the field. Why look at me? You're first, Cedar Park. You're first. Okay, so I'm Mike Harmon. I'm the Chief of Police for Cedar Park Police Department. Tonight I have with me Sergeant Justin Miller. Uh, what's your name again? No. Commander Chance Thomas and uh, Lieutenant Bobby Vernango, and they're some of our subject matter experts um, when it comes to some of the topics that we'll be discussing tonight. I've been with the department almost 25 years. I've been in law enforcement for almost 28, 29 years. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've supervised SROs, uh, different various positions of the department. Um, I've been involved with LISD. I've put three kids through uh, Leander ISD schools. Just graduated the last one in May of 2022. Ooh, ooh, done. <laughs> so um, this is a very uh, important topic uh, for me uh, as far as an investment into the school district, the importance of safety, uh, Fentanyl, we want to talk about that a little bit tonight and stuff like that. So um, that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Sure, you want to go, Chief? Sure. I don't mind. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Greg Menton, and I'm the Chief of Police of the Leander Police Department. I've been with the City of Leander for about 27 years. I've been Chief since 2012. Um, my real story about this is I'm, I'm a, uh, I love the SRO program and the officers in the schools. I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, gra graduated in 1988. We had a cop on campus and I was surprised when we came here that we did not have a comp on campus, but it was a smaller town than when, uh, when I got here. Um, I think what we're, what we're supposed to talk about tonight, what we're going to talk about is, is on every parent's minds. I think, uh, my kids went to Round Rock ISD. Um, and, uh, you know, when I sent my kids to school, I entrusted Round Rock PD to do what they need to do to keep my kids safe as well. But like any other parent, I think we're, we're uh, afraid of what? We send them off and we hope that they're going to be okay. And they're all the indifferent influences that come in and, and uh, are just kind of, I think, scary for, for, for any parent that's out there. So I hope that tonight we can at least uh, talk about some of those things and maybe bring some of those things in your mind to ease. You know, this is a tough topic. Uh, one thing I'm excited about, like I said, to being part of this is 24 years ago, our partnership with LISD started because we started the first SRO program at Leander High School. And I was voluntold to be that guy. Uh, didn't want to do it. I uh, had actually argued with my chief at the time that probably wasn't the best guy for that particular job, but he didn't give me an option. So um, since then, uh, I've, been, I've supervised it uh, until I became chief. They kind of take you out of everything and let other people do stuff. But uh, again, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because I think the number one thing of anybody in here who's a parent or even kids is we want to make sure our kids are safe and taken care of. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be here to even you were interested in hearing what we have to say. So thank you. All right. Anyone else want to share? Constable. Make sure I don't yell at this thing. Uh, I'm Jeff Anderson. I'm the uh, Precinct 2 Constable for JP. I'm sorry, Precinct 2 Constable for this precinct, which is Precinct 2. Um, I've been in law enforcement for 32 years. Uh, retired from Travis County after almost 29, then I've been doing the constable role. It's an elected position. Um, I do have three ch older children that graduated from Leander, and I still have a junior that's at Leander High School. And uh, one of the things that uh, I want to reiterate is that we're all in a partnership together. Uh, we work, you know, with all the local agencies, whether it's law, uh, the police department, whether it's fire, EMS, and uh, we are 
are trained and we are equipped to respond to calls that are of high nature and uh, high priority calls. And you can, you can probably imagine what those calls might be. And uh, based on my experience, I, I, I just thought that it was important that we get to play a role with this whole team up here. I don't know if any constable's office has, constable's office has done that here, but uh, I just thought it was, a, it was something I really wanted to, to pursue and, and get active with. And then I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you. I think this, this is a really good place to start because you talked about the partnership. So um, if our chiefs or our emergency responders can talk a little bit about what that partnership with the district looks like and how we work together. Well, first of all, <clears throat> let me just say this. I wanna thank every one of y'all for being here tonight and taking an interest in this topic and listening to what we have to say. I wish I was looking out here and the whole room was full. Um, but the one theme you're going to hear over and over tonight is it takes all of us and it starts at home. It starts with education with your kids um, about, you know, drugs, alcohol, safety, security and stuff like that. And you'll hear that same thing throughout the entire uh, presentation tonight. But for us, the Cedar Park Police Department, we have uh, several SROs in the high schools uh, here in Cedar Park and the incorporated city limits of Cedar Park. Um, we also, uh, something new uh, to the district and to our department this year is we just added an additional canine uh, to our, uh, our unit and it is basically a bomb detection dog um, who can sniff out explosives, uh, firearms, and it can also track uh, lost kids or, you know, adults and stuff like that. But I think that's a huge asset for this year because as everybody knows, if you get one of these bomb threats or bomb calls to one of the schools, it takes a lot of resources, it takes a lot of time. So now we're able to um, hopefully cut that time in half, deploy the dog. Um, it is open to all the resources here in, uh, or agencies in Central Texas, uh, Leander, Cedar Park, LISD, pretty much everybody, uh, if they need it, it's available. Um, we do the Explorer program uh, through the Boy Scouts of America. And that starts, uh, I think at the age uh, 13 up to uh, 2021. And it's just allow kids uh, who have an interest in law enforcement uh, to be a part of the department. Uh, they learn rank structure, they learn respect. Um, they get to participate in different events uh, across the country. And hopefully, you know, the end game is to uh, send them off to college. And then when they come back, they're, they're prepared to uh, join the department as a full-time uh, police officer. Uh, what else do we do? Let's see, I wrote, some, wrote a few things down. We also provide uh, security when the schools open for shelters uh, in the event of a tornado, hurricane, and stuff like that. Uh, we'll partner with LISD and provide the security if this, uh, any of the schools do per, uh, become a, uh, a shelter for uh, evacuees. Do you like to answer the question? Sure, I, I mean, I'm gonna say ditto, except we don't have the, uh, <laughs> we don't have the dog, but, um, uh, but partnerships are key. I think that's the only way that we can ever uh, make this work together. You know, everybody uh, that, that kind of comes together from these departments that are up here. Uh, the one thing that I love about this area is uh, even though we have city limits, different patches, it doesn't really matter when, when we really need one another because we just all blend in and, and, and do what we need to do. Even the cities, uh, Leander and uh, Cedar Park with, some, uh, with Georgetown and also Pflugerville have a partnership SWAT team, which is centralized regional SWAT team that makes it work and are highly trained to deal with situations that uh, can come across at our schools or in our cities. So uh, I think partnerships are, are the strength and the backbone. Uh, one thing the district does have, and, and this is really unique if you think about partnerships in this district in itself, is that you won't find very many districts like this that have multi-jurisdictions um, at police departments that all kind of work together at the same time. But one thing that we do have that we didn't have when I started as an SRO is uh, Russell Bundy on the end. We, we, they did have somebody in that role at one point, but it's a liaison to, to work with the police directly with the school district. Because you can imagine like any company, if we had a problem or had an issue, trying to find an, uh, a principal who's trying to deal with the same thing or somebody on campus to kind of help us walk through that problem is quite difficult. So now if there's a situation that comes up on campus, off campus, I mean, Russell and I talk all the time. I'm like, hey, this is what just happened. Just kind of heads up, this could or could not affect you. And uh, it kind of helps out all of us to get information to you as parents faster 
and to get information to the police as, as well uh, quicker. So uh, I think, again, partnerships are, are the key to make this thing work. Thanks so much, Chief. I love how all these questions are bleeding into one another because that was our next question is, is we've got to hear from our emergency responders, our chiefs here. But um, Russell, if you could talk a little bit on, from, our, uh, from the district perspective about that partnership. Well, it's, it's been uh, four or five years of this, getting it built and strengthening the partnership. Uh, I've come from the law enforcement world uh, 30 plus years. Uh, majority of it was Texas Department of Public Safety. Uh, kind of a funny story is uh, Mike over here was an investigator when I was an investigator and he used to laugh at my Chevy Lumina car when I come to visit him all the time. And I mean, it wasn't a bad car. You couldn't tell it was a police car, but anyway, it's just so funny that how we all kind of grew in this district all together. And it seemed such a great fit when this job came up. And that's been the strength of, of how we operate because it doesn't seem like a huge city where you're lost at it. Everyone has personalities and, and, and ways that, that they love to handle things and, and just the way that their demeanors and professionalism. Um, so a lot of those partnerships, so when we look at it, is, is things that we've been able to do, uh, establish how, uh, for example, in a lockout. You know, my, my, our question was we sat down is how do we get police in when everyone's in a lockout, a lockdown, I'm sorry, lockdown uh, process. So this is just a small example of, of things we've tried to partner with with our officers and getting them access into the buildings because that's the first people you want in the buildings when we have a situation or, or an event. So this is something we've strengthened. The two, the two worlds come together when I've been able to know the law enforcement world. I know the education world, I know all the acronyms, and you know, I can bring this, this together. And so when we have a situation that involves law enforcement with our students and staff, um, I can come in there and kind of do that. Because a lot of times if it's a criminal investigation, we need to make sure we're doing a parallel investigation because this, the school has their part to do as well. But as long as we're, we're trying not to interfere with each other's role as we uh, look into a child's situation, if it is criminal or not criminal, if it could be a policy violation or is it criminal. So we bring these two parties together and, and, and work side by side. And that's really helped us a lot. Excellent, thank you so much, Russell. Um, I think the big question on a lot of our parents and our families' minds for law enforcement is, how are you keeping the school communities safe? Go ahead, Greg. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's a big question. So um, I think one of the things as far as keeping our school community safe is the uh, implementation of the uh, SRO program, having officers, like I said, within the school. Um, the officers, at, in, just as in Cedar Park, we've got officers at both uh, the, the high schools. If you can imagine, the high schools are probably the busier places where, where things are happening. But all of our officers uh, that are at the schools, we also have one that's at uh, New Hope High School. If you haven't heard of that, look it up. And then we also have one at the Leo Center, um, uh, officer that, and we also have an officer that kind of rose between those schools. Um, you know, one thing about school districts is they are part of our community because anything that happens on a campus can bleed over to a neighborhood or, or vice versa. But I think just with the, with the way that, I guess the, the program is set up and just having officers on campus, always on campus is one way to, uh, to kind of keep things uh, safe because relationships with SROs have with their students, which is, I think, super important because we had a lot of uh, kids that build those relationships and will come and tell our SROs things that are happening on campus that no normally get talked about because, you know, um, I said this the other day, it's uh, my kids, I'm, I'm gonna go off a side story, is uh, both my kids, cops kids, right, raise them to, to, to respect and all those kind of things. Well, they were telling me about something that was happening on campus and I asked them if they had told their SRO and they said no. And I said, well, why? They said, well, dad, don't be a snitch. And I said, I've never taught them that, but they've learned that, right? And, but my daughter would hang out there with, with the SROs and, and, and probably did tell them things. I don't know, maybe she didn't want to tell me that. But uh, uh, I just think that's, that's the key in just that relationship and building there and having those officers on campus. Um, because if and when a situation happens, that's who's gonna be there to kind of handle that problem, so. You need to say ditto if you need to. Ditto. You know, that, that's a good question is, uh, what are we doing to keep kids uh, safe and the staffs safe? And, you know, like Greg said, one of the things is the partnership with LISD and that communication with Russell. Uh, he's been great over the past, how long has it been? 
10 years now, four or five years. Uh, you know, and anytime there's anything going on, he's a phone call away and, and we can make that phone call and uh, get to the bottom of whatever need. Some of the things that we're doing internally uh, to make sure that uh, not only the kids, the staff are safe, but as well as our responding officers. Um, we have put a, uh, in our, you'll see the in-car computers, but every in-car computer, they, they have the ability to pull up a map of a school. So if they're responding to a school, they can pull up the map and, and see the different locations of rooms and, and things of that nature, uh, so they know where they're going. Uh, we've purchased additional equipment um, to, in the event that, you know, God forbid, we have to go in, into a school for uh, an extreme situation, uh, we can get into doors, we can pry doors open, um, purchase additional shields that are high ballistic, uh, stopping uh, pretty much a high caliber rifle round. Um, so we've equipped our folks with that. Uh, doing security assessments at different schools, seeing you know what areas are vulnerable, uh, what needs to be improved, uh, what's working, what's not working, things of that nature. And uh, so those are just a few of the things that, you know, we're doing. But, uh, you know, really it's as long as we're keeping that line of communication open with LISD and, and law enforcement, um, I think that's huge. It's, it's important. So thanks. Yep. Thank you, Chief. Yep. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about substance abuse. And this question is for our Director of Counseling Services, Steve Clark. How does the district teach about substance abuse? And I'm trying to pull this, this slide. Oh, it's working now. Okay, okay, perfect. So obviously the first thing we want to do, and let me put that back and present, is we want our students to be connected to school. That's our number one goal. If we can get students connected through some program, whether it be band, fine arts, athletics, CTE, or any other club, that's a great first step, just like as Dr. Kantz mentioned earlier. But we also have health TEKS that are required that to be taught each year. And so you can see these are the lessons that um, our coordinator for student and family support team, Marianne Kluga, who's in the back, she creates these lessons. And our PE teachers in grades K through five teach these lessons. And we she reviews them each year and updates them. And so one of the things that we always include in all of them are refusal skills. How do you tell uh, how do you tell someone no, you don't want to take something? And so we put this all in developmentally appropriate language. We don't want to teach kindergartners about marijuana or you know some of those types of things. So we talk about in kindergarten, is this safe or is this dangerous? If you find a pill in your house, will you should you put that in your mouth? Or if someone is giving you something that you don't know. So it's a lot of safety issues. And then as kids get older, we start introducing more uh, appropriate topics. So these are taught in grades K through five. And I will mention that one of the things we've added in the last couple of years has been vaping or uh, e-cigarettes. So we've added that. And we've also added um, in the last year uh, more information about fentanyl. In grades six through eight, we also talk about, so these are our topics in grades six through eight. So we teach, Marianne actually teaches these lessons on each campus. Uh, throughout the year. Um, and so we will be reviewing these again at the end of this year and for, as we move into next year. But we've already taught multiple of these lessons at our elementary schools, or I'm excuse me, at our middle schools this year as well. So. All right, thank you, Steve. One more question for you, switching gears again, back to security and, um, and uh, safety on our campuses. Um, we go through an awful lot of drills on our campuses. And one of the questions that we received through Thought Exchange was, do drills cause trauma? Possibly. It depends on the student and it depends on the background that the student comes in with. And so there is that possibility that a student could be impacted by a drill. But I think it's how we approach it as the adults in their life, be it counselors, principals, assistant principals, teachers, how they approach that drill and use the developmentally appropriate language in giving them. So. We may not talk about it. we're doing an active shooter drill in kindergarten, but we are going to say we are going to have a drill where we have to be very quiet for a little bit of time and we're going to shut the door. So it's getting them used to if I do something, uh, if we need to shut the door and lock it and we have to be quiet, that's a practice. That's a drill we're going to practice. So it just depends on. And so I go back to as a former special ed teacher, I had a kid, a student who is very sensitive to loud noises. And so we just prepared him 
for the fires drill because it was very loud and he would we gave him options for that drill so i think the for me is when we talk about drills is if we have that partnership with our families if we know that a student is going to be impacted by any type of drill reach out to your school your teacher your principals your counselors so we can prepare that student and address that with them on an individual basis because we know that can impact certain students all right wonderful did our law enforcement have anything to share on that particular question about drills okay awesome oh can you uh, hang on to that mic and pass it on down to Kristen um we're gonna ask um Kristen about um, Narcan, uh, naloxone, as uh, Dr. Kantz had talked about. So um, do LISD students have access to Narcan? Yes, so we have Narcan on every single one of our campuses, elementary through high school. We have them in our nursing go bags. So anywhere the nurse goes, the Narcan goes. We have principal des designated staff members that are also trained to administer the Narcan if needed. And if we have anybody on our staff, on our campuses that come up and want to learn how to administer Narcan, um, have any questions or want resources, we are there to provide that for them. So leading this sim similar question for our law enforcement and emergency responders, what has been your experience with Narcan? All right, I'm going to go since they're waiting, taking too long, because this is the one I've been waiting for, to be honest with you. <laughs> so sit back and uh, we're going to be here for a while. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, every single one of our officers carry Narcan, and um, it's a lifesaver. I can't tell you how many times uh, our, our officers have had to use Narcan and save lives. And I know you guys want to talk, and I'm going to give you a chance, but I've feel that it's very important that you guys hear from Sergeant Justin Miller because he is over our organized crime unit. They partner with DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, and are tackling the fentanyl issue. And I think it's important that you all hear this information. And if anybody is going to watch this at home or what, that's why I wish this room was full because uh, the message needs to get out there and everybody needs to hear it. So if you guys want to go ahead, and then I'm going to turn it over to him just for a few minutes. I know we're short on time, but I, I, I feel very strongly about this. And like I said, I put three kids through LISD schools, and it's not, you know, hey, I hope they graduate. It's, hey, I hope they live through high school. And it's not a knock on school, school districts. It's peer pressure outside of the schools. And it literally, folks, I'm telling you, it, it takes a very, very small amount to kill you. Very small. So you guys want to go or chief i just really wanted to kind of uh add to what you're saying the fire department and uh, ems services have always carried medicines uh traditionally whereas the law enforcement has not and what became very prevalent and obvious was that we were facing such a problem nationwide uh, that it was critically important that our, our law enforcement started carrying it as well because they usually get there before we do. They usually are there stabilizing the scene and making it safe so that we can then come in and provide treatment. But it is such a, a devastating uh, epidemic that this that you, you can't overstate how important Narcan is. And, and when we found out that uh, I also have kids in the LISD school district and, and have graduated, and when I found out this year that uh, Narcan was now being carried at all the schools, that was a, a big relief to me because, again, it doesn't have to be uh, a, an intentional ingestion. It can be an accidental ingestion. And just having that stuff available it saves lives, absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Justin over there, but I just wanted to chime in and say, like, we've been doing it for a while, but. I believe now at this point that our officers are probably saving more lives with it than we are just simply because of the need for speed to get it there and get it on board. So as Chief said, um, I'm over the organized crime unit and our, our primary function is narcotics enforcement and distribution and trying to interrupt the flow of drugs in the region. And I remember early on in 2020, I was sitting down with an overdose victim and while we were there, Williamson County EMS, a counselor from Williamson County EMS had come to the house and knocked on the door and had delivered Narcan to the victim. And I remember being very skeptical at the time thinking, well, this is just going to encourage use. And not too long after that, I saw firsthand Narcan saving lives. And 
with the increased demand, with the increased distribution of not just the counterfeit pills, but now powdered fentanyl, um, Narcan has become a necessity, and it's become a necessity not just for police and fire and EMS, but really, I mean, especially in the schools. Um, you know, we've seen it, school-age children selling and using it. Um, so the, the ability to be able to reverse the effects as quick as Narcan does and, and how quickly it can save somebody's life, it, it, it's absolutely become a lifesaver and just something else for us to put in our tool belt to, to help prevent these fatal overdoses. Anyone else want to share? All right. Um, this question is for um, Kristen Wicket. Okay, awesome. So, um, does LID, LISD have trauma kits, and where are they located? Yes, we have trauma kits on every single one of our campuses, and they are located with all of our AEDs. So wherever there's an AD on the campus, there will be a trauma kit. Thank you. Um, so this question is for Steve, if you want to pass that microphone down to him. How do we support, this was a, as a, real, a really interesting question. When we first opened the thought exchange, we immediately got questions surrounding security and safety and um, just tons of questions about campus support and our facilities. Um, and then we saw quickly how our responses started to change and shift and, and see how mental health became um, a much more prevalent concern coming from our LISD community. So this is a question for Steve. Um, how do we support mental health in the district? This is one I could also talk about for quite some time, you know, because I, it, I'm very passionate about mental health. Um, one of the things that we have is we obviously I work with school counselors, so those are, are often considered our academic counselors, but really they are our first point of contact for mental health concerns for our students. And so while some of them are licensed professional counselors, which is a different licensing board, the Texas Behavioral Health Board, um, some of them are LPCs, but they are not required to be an LPC to be a school counselor. They are licensed through TEA to be a, a school counselor. So they do help with that first initial contact for a mental health concern. And then if the concern is a little bit above what we would expect a school counselor to do, we have, uh, uh, we are very lucky to have and have had for almost 20 years before I even joined the district, um, 15 licensed clinical social workers, um, a licensed professional counselors and LCDC licensed, oh, I'm gonna get this wrong, Marianne, licensed, uh, chemical dependency counselor. Okay, so we have those three uh, licensed uh, individuals, or those three types of licensed individuals, and there are 15 of them in the district, which is unusual, and uh, we see more and more districts hiring them, but we've been doing this for quite some time. They are licensed by the state of Texas to provide um, mental health services to students directly. One thing I want everyone to know is they must have parent consent first because of their license, because they're licensed by the Texas Behavioral Health Board. They will not provide any of those services without parent consent in an intake. So we're not, we don't do any of that without consent. So that can be school day therapy. We also have community partnerships with our primary one. Well, there's three primary ones. We work with our local mental health authorities, Blue Bonnet Trails, we have uh, agreements with them in Integral Care in Travis County, so Blue Bonnet's in Williamson and Integral Care's in Travis. But one we've been really utilizing quite a bit this year, in the last two to three years, is through, um, it's called T-Chat, and I'm not gonna be able to remember what T-Chat stands for, it's one of those long acronyms, but it was created by the Texas legislature, I think in the previous session, and it's required that any teaching hospital within the state will provide teletherapy services to a local ISD. And so we signed on the first year that Dell Children's um, offered that to us. And so we are able to make a referral to Dell Children's um, if it's beyond what we can provide during the school day. And then Dell Children's provides kind of a transitional therapy services to students and families. And again, Parents are completely involved. Uh, they, are, they go to the uh, teletherapy sessions with them. We primarily use it for early uh, access to uh, pediatric or psychiatric uh, services and to get kids whose parents want to maybe pursue medication. It's hard for them to do that sometimes. 
Um, then we also, we use uh, what's called the Columbia, Su Columbia uh, Suicide Severity Rating Scale. It's a, a suicide screener. And that is used for any, it's designed um, so that any lay person could ask those six questions. And why that's important is if we have to involve another agency, they all know what the Columbia is. So if our law enforcement partners were involved, many of them, their mental health officers may know about that, but our blue bonnet and our local hospitals will all know if you answered the questions this way on the Columbia, that gives them a, a type of an indication of where they, um, a student might be on the suicidal ideation. So that's how we uh, partner with community agencies as well as the services that we provide during the school day. Thank you, Steve. For our law enforcement, for our emergency responders, uh, we've been shut down for practically two years. What are y'all seeing surrounding mental health and um, wellness in, in the community? Um, yeah, that's actually a great question. I'd kind of like to piggyback that off of what was just stated. Sure. Um, several months ago, LISD hosted a law enforcement symposium on mental health and how do we, as a region, how do we come together and, and tackle this, this problem? And what we found is that every entity, every agency in Williamson County, school districts, everyone's facing this mental health crisis uh, with uh, students and um, citizens. So the partnership, how do we come together? Uh, the conversations are happening and the resources are, are getting put in place. Um, I do want to mention, uh, we were fortunate recently, we, we uh, got approved to form a full-time mental health unit in Cedar Park, uh, where we can dedicate officers on a full-time basis to mental health response. Um, we're partnering with Blue, with Blue Bonnet and we're excited that when we get that program up and running, that we can link up with LISD to help with the response to students at schools. Um, the last several years have been extremely challenging for our students, as you know, uh, having to do remote learning, dealing with all the turmoil that's going on in the world, they're talking about it. And so one of the points that I'd like to drive home real quick, if I may, is we were talking today in command staff about, you know, it can be tough, right? Your, your, your kids come to school and they get, uh, they have a good relationship with the SRO and maybe they talk to the SRO or they interact with a counselor but then they might go back home and there's dysfunction at home, right? And so all the progress that you've made with them at school, be it a teacher or an SRO, like I said, they, they have to go back home and maybe into a tough environment uh, or just with the, the social media stuff that our kids are facing today, um, the state of the, of the world, it's so important that we talk to our kids. Uh, today's society, we're so busy with work. We're so busy with all the goings on, politics, whatever it may be. Um, and we have to take a concerted effort to talk to our kids, be present, right? Put our phones down, I don't wanna get preachy, but talk to them because they might talk back to you. That might help with the mental health problems, that might help with the fentanyl problems, uh, that might help with the disconnected problems that we're seeing. And we talk about it all the time in law enforcement. What else can we do? Um, Chief mentioned that we need our parents to be heavily invested and attentive to their kids because that might help a lot with all of these issues as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I just want to piggyback on what Chance said. One of the greatest assets that we have is the SROs in schools and also more so is the relationships that they build with the staff and, and with the students. All of our officers are, are certified mental health officers, so they've all been trained to deal with people in crisis as well as be able to recognize people in crisis. Um, I guess more than anything, being a, a, a parent, and my, my wife's a, uh, a middle, or sorry, a high school English teacher, and she deals with this stuff all the time. And I spent four years in the school as a school resource officer. I spent time at Leo. I spent time at, at Leander High School. And while in those spaces, I always knew when the kids were troubled because I built a relationship with them. Also going into it, I knew what the resources were. I was able to get with the teachers. I was able to get with the counselors. And also, I made myself available to students that were having trouble, trouble at home, trouble in the school setting, and, and trouble with other students. And it's that availability and being able to help them work through that problem. It's more than just responding to a crisis. It's how do we look at the, how do we find out what those needs are? And we can't do that without a relationship. And we, we pursue that both inside, inside the school as well as outside the school. And what was kind of neat going from a school setting when I was at, when I was an SRO back to the street was now I was dealing with these kids on the street and I knew them and I knew their parents and I knew how to deal with them a little bit better. So 
that's definitely a blessing having that program and having access to those resources because an officer responding just from the street to the school they're not familiar with all the resources so that's why the SRO program is so important Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for your passion and sharing. It's an amazing to see that kind of commitment. We appreciate it. Um, moving on to a series of questions that we have about safety and security. You can imagine that was a big topic in our thought exchange. This question is for um, Darla. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the door audits that we've heard so much about? This summer, the um, state of Texas put out four initiatives to all Texas schools, and they included doing a um, survey of all your exterior doors and making sure that they were identified on a campus map. And not only that, that you had to look at the components, you had to look to see steel framing, you had to look if it was an automatic closure, was it an automatic lock door. Um, and you looked at each of those different components with that door, and then you determined was each thing functioning and operating correctly. If they weren't, then we needed to have work orders. If there was a work order already on it, why hadn't the work order been um, taken care of? So we went through a whole process this summer of our campus administrators looking at each and every one of their um, exterior doors um, and looking at it again with all the components. The other uh, uh, initiative was also doing a school safety survey. There was about 47 questions that was asking us about our processes and our procedures, our programs, our uh, training of our staff, um, just a whole host of questions to, for us to answer and to compile and be able to put back to the state for um, our district. Those were the two summer initiatives. Then there was two initiatives that are ongoing throughout the school year. And one of those is the uh, weekly door audit. So every week, a school administrator is walking during the school day um, and checking the exterior doors to ensure that everything is continuing to operate as it's uh, supposed to be uh, functioning. And as well as making sure nobody has um, propped a door open or scheduled a door that's not being monitored. Monitored. So no longer will a door be scheduled or should be propped without somebody taking action immediately to remedy that. And um, the, the thing that we had to uh, change with that whole process, as you can imagine, with a high school that's a multi-building and students need to flow back and forth between those buildings to get to class. So we had to relook at our processes and procedures, look at our courtyards and make sure that we can keep things um, secured. When we talk about safety and security, we talk about layers. And the first layer that we have is our exterior um, entries of our building, making sure there's only one point of uh, entry into our school and that all the other doors stay secured um, during the school day. So you hit on a really good point. It's not just our secondary campuses that have that uh, go through the outdoors to get to another building. We have a lot of portables across the district. How do we address portable security um, regarding different threats? Okay, so again, we do have portables out there. We've had portables for years. I've been with the district for 29 years and there's always been a portable on a campus. So we've had portable guidelines for years and we know that we keep our third graders third graders and higher in those portables because they're more responsible and can follow through with the directions. We use buddy systems. Um, we have key cards that allows them to be able to go back and forth between the buildings. We have steel framed uh, doors on our portable doors and that we make sure that there's a peepo on there so that they can see if anybody would come to the door that they can see who's there without opening the door. Our processes and procedures are this, that we do not release our students students from a portable. They are released back from um, the front office so that our students and our parents are not coming out to the portable and releasing from out there. So we have quite a few different um, processes and procedures. Um, it even comes down to the standard res uh, response protocol that I talked about earlier um, about when we have a secure uh, event going on, which is uh, locking out, is it safer 
for that situation for them to stay in the portable or is it safer to bring them into the building? So if we have severe weather, we bring them into the building and then we have uh, plans for how they're going to continue their education um, if they are able to do that um, at that time. If there's something going on in the neighborhood, it may be perfectly fine to leave them secured within the uh, portable depending on what we're hearing is the situation that they're dealing with. So again, we rely on the protocols that we have to uh, work through the situation that's being brought to us. And one more question for you. We have numerous new facilities all across the district, some of which have walls of glass. Um, how do we as a district balance safety and security with these best learning environments that we've, we've established? Well, of course, there's pros and cons um, to every building design from our older designs to our new designs. And so we just work within those um, challenges to make sure that the campus administrators have applied um, the best practices that we keep teaching, training, and doing tabletops on, that they've applied it for their situation because not every campus is going to do everything exactly the same. So yesterday I was out at one of these campuses working with their staff and talking through them on the staff development day on um, what that would look like for them in different scenarios, different situations. And that's what we have to continue to do. We have to have them continue to ask the questions, to look at their environment and be able to apply um, any of the emergency responses that might be needed on any given thing. It could be something that's happening down the hallway from them. It could be something that's happening on the whole other side of the building. We, we do have um, what we call zone areas in those areas where we're able to uh, push a lockdown button and lock off those areas and be able to uh, reduce the amount of areas that a person can go to um, if somebody gets in our building. We look at how if they're using the collaborative spaces, which is which is so awesome for the day-to-day -day education of our students. We need that opportunity for our kids. We want to be able to have these, but they have to know what would they do if they have an unsafe situation and need to pull back into a lockdown um, area. So we work with them a lot on those processes and those procedures. We continue to use different scenarios to be able to work uh, with staff and students on those. Thank you so much, Darla, such good information. I think I have just a few minutes left and I just wanna to get to the last few questions. For our law enforcement, for our emergency responders, how do you establish what is a credible threat? That's always a pretty difficult one, and, but you know, to try to explain to a group of people, because I think anytime there's a threat made on a campus, everybody is worried about what's going on, but credible threat is typically something that's factual and that we know could be a possibility and, and I could probably talk on this for quite some time but I'll kind of keep it simple you know when you're when you're assessing a situation of what's going on or a threat that's being made there's a lot of people and a lot of work that goes behind it from looking at social media trying to get a profile on the person or individual to see what maybe have happened in their life in the last certain amount of time to see if you know if there's a, a something that could have happened I mean I know uh, you know say recently you know you've got people who will just make these especially after you've all day will just make these open threats and uh, a lot of times we'll find out that they're coming from other countries other states uh they're they're being um used over and over and over the same pictures uh and and they're just changing the name and saying to somebody at the school so it i think when you look at credible is you're just trying to break it down and look at the facts to see if if that particular situation is a serious threat at that time because one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to lock a school down every single time that we think something's happening that we're not 100% sure on or cause a, a, a panic or what we talked about in these drills, undo trauma on any of our children. And um, uh, so there's a lot of diligence that's put into, into, uh, into that thought process for, for what law enforcement needs to do. A lot of that is just working with the schools as well. Uh, and that's where that partnership comes in and, and uh, trying to establish that information that they're getting from the school. You know, sometimes we get somebody will call and say, hey, there's a bomb threat at the school. I just read it on the bathroom wall and we go in there and it was dated like last year. And we're like, okay, well, it's not gonna be too credible because that's already been a year since that threat was particularly made. But there's some that, like I said, our social media has been the biggest challenge for us just because, you know, that information can just get dropped. And then, you know, everybody's scrambling uh, at, the, at the departments trying to figure out, okay, how, how is this lined up? What, what on here? is actually true is this picture that's in the background actually somewhere that we can recognize um, on a campus or, or uh, 
or in our own city. So, Mike, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to add or chance. Yeah, yeah I'll just piggyback off achievement real quick. Two quick things. Um, the one guarantee is that when we get any threat, it is vetted very quickly. Uh, we look into it immediately. Leander PD would look into theirs immediately because you have to take every threat seriously. But the second part of that is the social media expectation. We're very cognizant. I, as a parent, would want to know what's going on, but we have to balance the veracity of these threats with against how quickly do you put information out. I know LISD is the same way that we'll try to coordinate that message so we don't put out inaccurate information and get parents, you know, rushing to the school on something that's not valid, but also balancing that against trying to put the information out quickly. Uh, so if you get frustrated sometimes with that piece of it, that's kind of what we have to, to tackle on how and when to release the information, make sure it's accurate. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap up now. And this, uh, we have a room of parents here. And we just want to be able to share what kind of resources, how can we engage with our families and, and really, um, Dr. Kantz, what can parents do to help their children avoid substance misuse or abuse? I know, I already got a microphone. Um, so I think we've heard it throughout the evening. Um, one of my recovery um, colleagues has said that the opposite of, of addiction isn't sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And so I think the more that we can help our kids early on feel like they are in a connected and supported society. And does that mean connecting with law enforcement? Does that mean connecting with our teachers? You know, we need to make sure that we're creating environments where when kids are doing great, they're supported. When they need help, they're supported. And I think that's the best thing we can do. And from our law enforcement, um, how, how best do we equip our parents? So the main thing is, and I think this has kind of been the theme of the night, is just interaction and talking to your kids, um, you know, understanding social media, understanding, you know, just to give you an idea, the, the majority of the communication that comes from the um, distribution that we see, it's not phone calls, it's not text messages, it's TikTok, it's telegram it's signal it's instagram things like that so understand social media understand the emojis because i mean there's you know, believe it or not people can carry on conversations without typing a single word and they can do it by emoji now and, and that's how a lot of these transactions occur unfortunately sometimes and then you know as far as resources um you know if it, there's there's several out there uh, a change for cam is, is one of the the best programs that i've seen and it's unfortunate it's a foundation that was created out of tragedy um, a, a mother of an actual cedar park high graduate who uh, he passed away from an overdose a fentanyl overdose she's tried to make the best of what she could with the situation and encourage others and educate others and that's a that's a, a resource that anybody can can go to to try to get a, a a better understanding of how to approach this with your kids. Thank you very much. I am so humbled and so grateful for uh, this panel today. And thank you for allowing me to ask you questions. I'm gonna hand it over to John. Thank you. I wanna say thank you to our panel. Um, I think the information that was shared tonight was, was outstanding information. I know Chief Harmon mentioned this, that wish we had more people here in the audience. I would like for everybody to know there is 290 people watching online. And so, so that, is, that is great. Um, and I appreciate everybody watching on, online. Uh, one of the things that we will do is, is we have recorded this in, entire uh, uh, event and We'll work closely with our school community relations department, and, and I know they will reach out to our different cities and their public information officers to make sure that we are, are getting this information out to our, our families that were not able to, to make it this evening. And so uh, we know that this is a very important topic for, for our community, for our parents, for our students, for our staff. And so I really appreciate everyone being here. I appreciate our, our guests being here this, inf the, this evening to, to provide uh, information. Uh, they, they work closely with our students. They work closely with our families and, and the partnerships that we have uh, with, our, with our agencies is outstanding. Uh, I don't know that, that everybody gets to see that, the stuff that we, we do behind the scenes, but I think you hear, heard tonight that we have a strong partnership and we talk often 
and, and we share and, and we, we uh, rely on each other to, to keep our community and our schools safe. So, so thank you. Um, like I said, be looking for, for more information to, to be sent out. And, and we, if you have questions, if you, have, you need more information, uh, of course, we have resources uh, that you saw earlier. Reach out to us through Let's Talk. Uh, if you have questions for, for the district, we'll be glad to respond to those. If you have specific questions for your campuses, uh, what's happening at your campuses, your, your, your principals, assistant principals, counselors, nurses are a wealth of information. And, and so I highly encourage you to reach out to them. Um, it, it takes all of us. And you see it all the time when we flashed up those communication things, the way we keep our schools safe is is working together and so if you see something if you hear something let's let someone know and and you would not believe how often we are able to to help a student to help a staff member to help a family but just someone talking to to an adult and so i highly encourage if you if you know something if you see something to tell to tell someone so we can address that. We have resources in the district, we have resources in the community, and we wanna make sure that we're getting those resources to the, to the students and staff and parents in need. We have a few tables outside set up with, with information, with some, some different products, and I encourage you, if you haven't got, visited those tables, to please visit those tables. Uh, different community uh, partners as, as Steve talked about with, with Blue Bonnet, uh, Department of Health Sciences, probably said that wrong, but, but we have different community partners out there helping provide information. So thank you. I appreciate you being here this evening, and that concludes our event.